was because I was in a group Bible study with one of the administrators of DESTA. That's late 1980s, early 1990s, when this campus was getting go bought. And so before the students ever came, he suggested we wanted to go for an outing as a Bible study. So we came and slaughtered a goat here and uh, ate. So I still remember that before the building started, we, we had a wonderful time here as a Bible study group with our families. That must certainly more than it's more than that years uh, more than that years ago, and um, since then I have come to talk to the students many times, and I've also think I've talked to the staff, Japu in Valley Road, so uh, I'm pretty pretty well con pretty well connected. Uh, I write books, and one of the books that is connected with what we are dealing today, I call it Christianity and Culture. And I would, I, would, I, would, I would donate at least one of the books uh, for the library, so that at least as I make reference to it, you can, you can access, you can access it. And um, if interested in a copy, Focus is involved here, and Focus are my Focus are my distributors. So if you are interested in a copy, you can actually get one. But our subject today is on straight fire. What we really are talking about is worship by people who either don't qualify or they do it un unprocedurally. That's what we call a strange fire. And what three things uh, make this a very important topic. Because you see, if you are offering strange fire, as far as you are concerned, you are a worshiper. As far as you are concerned, you are going to heaven. But the truth happens to be that there's no heaven you will go to, and God does not accept your worship. He may not demonstrate it the way he demonstrated before, uh, with Anas and Sapphira and others, but simply you are wasting your time. Keep telling people, uh, becoming a pretender is a very expensive enterprise, which is my second point, because you can't fully enjoy your life on earth. Because people say, how can you do that? You're not a Christian. And yet, really, you are not really a Christian. So you can't enjoy the world, and you are not going to heaven. It's not that a double loss. If you have no intention of going to heaven, just enjoy Maisha. Kula Maisha, they say in Swahili. So it, I think it's pretty foolish to actually participate in something which you are not benefiting from. I, I, I think that's, uh, that's, that's why this is a, a very important topic. Thirdly, the fact is, although not all the time, God does not take it lightly. When you pretend to serve him, and you are actually not serving him the way he wants to be served. And so it can have consequences. This thing has gone to the extent that the other day driving, going to church, I turned on the BBC, and I had... A, a, a pastor, a reverend in an Anglican church in Canada, uh, saying that the pastor was the one talking. She said, I'm an atheist. Now, in fact, I turned it a little louder. I didn't imagine that an atheist can also be an Anglican reverend. But she is the one to saying, I'm an atheist. And it's, she said, and I quote, it is not necessary to believe in God to be a Christian. In other words, she believes he's a Christian, but not necessary to believe in God. And she explained that the Bible has many good teachings we can follow, but you don't have to believe in God for you to be a Christian. Um, just take the Bible advice, but don't bother with the, the, with the Bible's God. Okay, maybe that extreme, not many people are uh, that extreme, but um, uh, I, try to, I try to research on the church. Actually, the church finally had to leave the Anglican communion. But they, there were people, they, they, they voted. Those who wanted to remain in the church without, um, without, uh, without believing in, in, in the God of the Bible. And there were many. So it is those who don't want who actually had to leave. And um, recently, the Church of England actually voted and the majority agreed Irrespective of what the Bible says, they are going to be blessing marriages between 
I think they are called gay people. I don't know. Gay, I don't like the word gay because when I was growing up, gay meant happy. So, <laughs> oh, so and so is so gay. It meant the guy is happy. Now, <laughs> I'm not very old, but uh, <laughs> but the, the word has changed. I did my form 4 1971, and that's the language you spoke. You know, gay, you know, you are happy. Now, so anyway, let's you use the word. I'm sure for mo most of you, you understand the word gay. So they are being now blessed. Now, whether you use the word married or blessed is irrelevant. You are actually putting a rubber stamp on something the Bible does not say. They are still worshipping. They are still bishops and archbishops. And in fact, I was reading something that said when the thing was put to the vote in the Synod in UK, the lay people were the ones that had a bigger percentage of people resisting uh, the blessing of marriages the bishops were two thirds of the bishop voted for the for the blessing of gay marriages. Can you then see this is a very serious subject? And um, and uh, you don't know those are people. They have no other job. They earn their money from the church. They intend to stay in the church, and they are seriously <laughs> worshiping. So they they put it. So I thought whoever whoever the committee that came up with this uh, subject. That's a very, very important subject for all of us to deal with. In fact, I would like to call it Christless Christianity. Christless Christianity. <laughs> the, first time I, the first time I went to the U.S. in the 1990s, I, we were in a conference. I'm a Gideon, so we give Bibles. We were having our Gideon conference. And I was in the conference, and uh, one of the Americans took me for lunch. And he said, would you like to say coffee? Yes. But which one? I said, I thought coffee is coffee. Said, no, 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 you can have decaffeinated coffee and coffee. I said, what is decaffeinated coffee? I didn't, I didn't know. Uh, and he told me decaffeinated coffee is coffee without coffee, coffee without caffeine. I said, our country grows coffee. How would I want to take coffee that is minus coffee? That's a cup of Christianity people are having. Christless Christianity, decristianized Christianity, where you are still a Christian, you are in church, you can even be an elder, but for Christ to have control on your life, they are not willing. In fact, some people go to the level where they actually are even saved. They want Jesus as a savior, but they don't want Jesus as Lord. They forget the name Jesus is not complete. They have, they have Jesus footballers. Have you heard? Have you heard of footballers who are called Jesus? Especially in South America. So it is, you, when you say Jesus, you haven't said, you must say Jesus Christ. Jesus, according to the Bible, means, and Mary was told, because you save his people. So when you say, I believe in Jesus, means I believe in a savior, one who forgives sins. But Christ means the anointed one, the Lord. So when you believe in Jesus Christ, not only do you believe in your need of a savior, not only do you believe in your need of forgiveness, not only do you admit you are a sinner, but you also say from now onwards, I am no longer in control of my life. I will not do what I like. I will do what God wants me to do. And you know, slowly, that idea of Christ not having, Christ not having a control on our life has become very, very common. Open your TV in the morning and you'll find on the TV written, command your morning. Have you seen that one? Command your morning. And <laughs> I laugh. Now, the guy writing that, has he commanded his morning himself? Because commanding your morning means, and actually, the, the, so you hear someone that you are the, in control of your life. Your life is in your hands. You can do with it whatever you want. So you command your future, you command your morning. And I say, well, then where is Christ in this? If I have the control of my life, where? Is Christ in my life. Because if I believe in Jesus Christ, I believe in the Savior who takes over the control of my life. He is the one who commands my day. He is the one who commands my morning. I keep saying, as you preach this Christless Christianity, where Christ is not in control, I think it will be very difficult to convince anybody who is thinking. Unfortunately, we seem to be, like now you are in a university, you people think hard to get big degrees. 
But they come to church, they check out their heads outside. You know, you, when you are in you don't require the head inside. You only go come with the body and the spirit. So you come to worship. So if anybody says something queer, you still say hallelujah. Have you noted that? These are people very educated. But when you listen to what they are listening, to what they are believing, you can't believe that they didn't check out their head outside. That's how shakahora happens. We can imagine somebody telling you to disobey the Bible. The Bible says, thou shalt not murder. That life is in God's hands. Then somebody tells you, ah, don't, don't listen to that. Just the way the devil says. He said, wait a minute. If you really want to meet the Lord, the way to meet him is to kill yourself. Once you kill yourself, you are sure to go to God. And we are told hundreds of people killed themselves. Isn't that what Chakaura is? Somebody clearly stating, uh, saying something that against the scriptures. And people are so spiritual and the head is outside. So they simply follow and kill themselves. So these strange fires are actually ending up in death. Shakahora is a sign of a strange fire. And I thought our interest today is to challenge ourselves and ask you, if I ask you what you believe, are you likely to tell me to ask your pastor? No, uh, that, that, what do you believe? What the Baptists believe? What the Baptists believe? Please ask my pastor. Now, you need to know that when you come to Christ, he wants you to love him with all your mind and with all your heart and with all your body. Now, if you are going to love him with all your mind, it will mean you engage your brain. You do not start believing things that you cannot verify from the scriptures. You know, Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13 says, Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandments of men. <laughs> In other words, these people whom we are describing as people who are offering straight fire, are people who draw near to God, but they do so with their mouths. They do so with their lips. But it's far removed from their hearts. In other words, the, 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 the emotions are there, but they are not totally handed over to the control of the Lord. That's all that the people we are calling. You know, we offer strange fires to the Lord. And sometimes we are doing so very innocently. Very, very innocently. We sing choruses that mean absolutely nothing. In fact, some mean something wrong. But because the dancing is nice. <laughs> we are so involved in the dance. You are wondering exactly what are you saying? You can find people seated singing one word. Yahweh, 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 Yahweh. Now, just try to talk to your father like that. Your own father. And you say, nga, 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 nga. Now, you are singing for me. You can see we are not using our mind. We check the mind outside in order to worship. And God is saying he doesn't want that type of worship. He wants you to give all your mind and all your heart and all your body, or, or what he calls your strength. So you ask yourself, are you in this category where you are singing with your mouth, but your heart and your mind are not accurate, are not accurate in, in, in involved. You know, these days, you go to campus, and I speak in campus quite a lot for the last almost 50 years. The first time I entered to a university of Christian Union was 1973, so it's about 50 years I've been involved in the Christian Union. And slowly it's turning out into more and more worship. The way people worship, I left the university in the mid-70s. The way people worship now is far much better in our time than our time. They are actually taking one full hour of worship. And I can tell you that because last Sunday I was in Jomo Kenyatta. The Sunday before then I was in Moranga University. The one before then I was in Masai Mara. The one before then I was in, in, in Meru University. For the last five Sundays I've been speaking in campus. And each one of all those I've mentioned where I've been for the last five Sundays, they take a full hour in worship. But you sit there and listen to what they are singing. It doesn't mean anything to God. It doesn't even mean anything to themselves. It's simply a way. By the time they finish, they are sweating. 
you preach and they are dozing because they are tired. <laughs> Those are called strange fires. Because you see, you, you, if, remember worship is talking to God. You must tell him something. One of the best people leading worship was called David. Just go to the Psalms. He doesn't say, praise the Lord, without saying why. Every Psalm that's about praise always gives a reason for their praise. But as we are saying, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. You know, you just, why? Not necessary. In fact, if you greet people, you start by saying, praise the Lord, brothers. We say, amen, we don't, without asking you, exactly what are you praising the Lord about? Because we are not using our, our mind. Because if you're using your mind, you must be able to tell me, praise the Lord, brother Nganga, for this and this other reason. So that I also can participate in praising the Lord. So I have been challenging the students. First of all, if it's an, an unchristian comes here and we are seeing it like that, like First Corinthians chapter 14 is asking, how is he going to know the Lord? How is he going to uh, understand the Lord when the, the choruses you are seeing are not communicating anything? There's nothing. The choruses of whoever wrote it was not trying to obtain anything, either in talking to God or talking to the people of God. So we must, and what here I'm emphasizing is that, to be fair, a lot of the times when we are, we are offering straight fires to God, we are innocent. We are doing it innocently. In fact, the intent is good. Because the intent is real worship. That's the intention. But unfortunately, once your worship does not involve your mind and your body and your soul, it will be rejected by God. He wants you to involve everything. You know, when you talk about the spirit of the age, we are talking about the things that are coming and taking over. They are called fads. And every generation has a fad. A few years ago, there was a one that began in Canada of people laughing. Ah, they, you come for a meeting, and for about 30 minutes, you are just simply laughing. Just Google it up. It was called Vineyard something. Um, and it was coming, and it came. A big fad of people laughing. You are not spiritual until you laugh. Not ha ha, but continuously for a period of time in worship. Now, you need to understand all these things will come and go. They are fads, but there's something you ask yourself, how is it moving? The other day I was talking to a sister, and she talked about, there's something they are, called, they are calling it about the male um, paternalism, where they are, they are talking about the whole idea about the male figure, you know, and, uh, and it's a serious sister in the Lord, and she's trying to talk about how there's something wrong with the way the men are in the Bible. So said, by the way, is God she or he? <laughs> Even that one can be changed. Now, are you talking about strange fires? Because you need to understand that God did not consult you <laughs> when he determined that he is he. The word of God only calls him he. So my sister, I sympathize with you because God never consulted you. If he had consulted you, he would have called he, she. Or maybe she. But this idea is coming. And you slowly it takes over until you start feeling. Many marriages are failing. And they are failing simply by worshippers. These are, these are people who are, who are born again. But they are worshippers who do not want to accept the biblical concept of marriage. I've, written, I've just written another book called Marriage, Christian or Traditional. Because you are trying, you are trying to find out what does it. And the Bible is clear about what marriage, Christian marriage, actually is. It's actually clear about it. But this idea about feminism has come to the extent that you feel like there's something wrong with the Bible. I'm not going to accept the Bible. Now, obviously, you don't have to accept the Bible. After all, it's a choice whether you go to hell or not. And choices have consequences. But you cannot call yourself a Christian at all, and do the opposite of what the scriptures are saying. So if you really don't want God's view of men and women, you simply have to stop worshipping. It's a waste of time worshipping God. Because God says in Genesis chapter 5, I made them male and female. And each of them, makes sense, I keep saying, 
I, last Sunday, the topic I was given by the, stu- by the students is LGBTQ. You know, students give you all kinds of, <laughs> all kinds of topics. And I was telling them, I was telling them last, last, last Sunday, part of the problem is that even Christians have accepted LGBTQ. Is that what I, that's the introduction I started with, isn't it? For a whole, for a whole, for a whole church. And you need to understand that part of the problem has to do with men and women refusing to accept the way God created them. So, you just feel like I, I want to sleep with another man. It's my pleasure. Why, who is God to ask me? I do what I want when I, I want. When, when I want. Now, surely, and they are still in worship. I was in, the, I was in South Africa some time back, and I found a book written, Aliens in God's Church. Aliens in God's Church. So I opened, and the foreword was actually written by Desmond Tutu. You know what the book is about? Top theological minds of South Africa trying to prove the Bible is not, and it's not against homosexuals. And in fact, Desmond Tutu writes, after winning of the fight against the white su- supremacy, we, the next fight is for the church to accept homosexuals. And the book says that, true, we are being rejected in some places, but we are not establishing our churches. And they talk about churches in South Africa, others in Zimbabwe, and they tell you where you can go to, to find the church. So they are now proper churches by homosexuals. Irrespective of what the Bible says. And you know, the Bible is not unclear about the topic. You know, for example, one of the things I read in the book, it's a huge book. I read in the book, and they say, oh, people like to, 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 to talk about that it's God is against homosexual because of Sodom and Gomorrah. But God was only unhappy, <laughs> not, because, not because of sodomy. He was unhappy with the way they treated angels. How did they treat angels? Surely you know how they treated angels. They wanted to sleep with the men, isn't it? But they are trying to find a way of uh, misinterpreting. The, they actually say there are six verses. The, the, the evangelists are, are tied against and they go through all the six verses in the Old and New Testament to prove all of them are misinterpreted. They are the only one with the truth. It's a big book and very, academic, very academically written. So I'm saying all this in order to tell you that these strange fires, initially, you feel, ah, I can't, how could they do that? After some time, you start saying it's understandable especially when some of your friends become part of it. Or especially when it's your pastor whom we admire becomes part of it. And you know, the moment you go to the step, initially it was bad, it's against the Bible. The second step is, I don't agree with it, but I understand him. When you understand somebody in error, you only one step to joining him. Am I communicating? You know, you know, me, I can't do that, but uh, you, you see a girl half, half naked. See, but you know, I, I, I can't be like that myself, but I understand her. What do you understand about nakedness? Now, you need to understand you are, the, moment, the moment you understand, in other words, you can't criticize it. The moment you understand that, you're only one step to also joining in. And that's why, like I told the students, uh, I told the students last, um, last Sunday, we need to come out very clear. The word of God expects us to love the sinner. There is nothing in the Bible that permits you to be against homosexuals. Because the Bible says, for God so loved, does it include homosexuals? Yeah. So if God himself loves homosexuals, who are we to hate homosexuals? We don't. We are not allowed by the scriptures to hate them. But we hate sin. The trouble is, if I see a thief in the congregation, I don't know you, so I don't know who among you is a thief. But if, I, if one of you is a thief, and against, I talk against stealing, nobody says I was against him. They understand I was against stealing. But when I talk against homosexuals, people don't say I was against homosexuals. They don't, they don't have homosexual sin. They say I'm against homosexuals. Can you see the difference? They are, mis- they are deliberately misinterpreting that when you talk against homosexuality, which the Bible is very clear on, 
they think we are we, we are a homo what are they called homophobia we are suffering from homophobia we are not we have no fear of homosexuals we hate homo sin and that when we talk about sin it's not just homosexuality have you had a new a new thing and because i've been speaking to young people for the last 50 years i told you i did my form 4 1971 from then one i've been preaching somewhere or another although i'm not a pastor I can tell you, slowly we have gotten to the level where, on average, I'm in the universities, when you say this is my girlfriend, you mean this is my sleeping partner. They don't understand, and they are in the Christian Union, but they don't understand how you can say you are my girlfriend and then refuse to sleep with me. <laughs> we are in a, my wife and I were, were running a, a weekend meeting for one of the universities just a few months ago. And uh, because we were there Friday, Saturday, Sunday, there was a lot of time to interact with the students. And so I came out very clear to them that the Bible is not unclear against sexual immorality. It's clear about it, because I already knew what they do. And I told them, if your boyfriend ever asks you for sex, that's not a matter to negotiate. You drop him like a hot potato. Because obviously, remember, temptation is not sin. But the guy has been tempted, tempted at you, now he is in it. By that time, he is just telling you how long he has struggled with it. And it means for him to ask you, to dare ask you for sex. He, first of all, he is admitting he is going to hell, but he's looking for company. Now, <laughs> because he is, for, for him to ask you for sex is a way of admitting he has given in to sin. Am I clear? If he is, and then he is asking you, I ask you, sister, I know you love him, but if he is going to hell, do you want to join him going to hell? I thought I was, because I was using very strong words, I thought I'm clear. During question time, when he allowed them to write questions, you cannot know who is writing. One of the girls wrote, I know you, I know what you said, but what about if I'm sure he loves me? In other words, he's asking for sex, but I'm sure he loves me. So even if I sleep with him, it's out of love. Isn't that amendment of the Bible? Remember the devil said, did God really say? That's exactly the same. In other words, did God really say that I cannot sleep with a girl I have not married yet? Or did he mean I should not sleep with a girl who is not in love with me? How can things that change? And so you have young people who are involved in sexual immorality regularly and in worship at the same at the same time and those problems become very big because the girl does not feel guilty the boy does not feel guilty because they are believing something else so they are actually they are in the choir they are whatever the other day a woman was uh, very happy that the daughter was involved in in, uh, in in worship and is a worship leader then they were living in a in a flat but then the boyfriend is the one who in the choir also was the one who used to drop her so she had that Boy, the, 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 she had the vehicle come to the compound, then they were not coming out. So the mother got interested and went to the window to look. They were actually having sex in the car. You don't want to tell your daughter you saw because what are you doing looking? But <laughs> <laughs> remember, these are worshippers. On Saturday, that is Saturday night. On Saturday morning, they are there. Hallelujah. Feels like the heavens will open. Now, you know, we are talking about strange. Fires. They don't feel guilty. And you ask it, the person says, but you know, we are in love. If you are in love, the Bible changes. Are you getting my point? And it's a very, very important thing you need to, to ask yourself are these things you are doing. You know, we are basing our text on Leviticus chapter 10. Chapter 10. Let me read verse 1. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense, and they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke of when he said, Among those who approach me, I'll be proved holy. In the sight of all people, I'll be honored. Aaron remained silent. That's the God we believe in. Some people think there is a God of Old Testament, a God of New Testament. It's no, it's one God. 
That's why the Bible is not the New Testament. It's both old and new. Somebody said, and I agree with him, the New Testament is actually concealed in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is revealed by the New Testament. So you have to read it, both of, both of them. And one of the things that's causing these strange fires is somehow we think God is a president, not a king. I know that two are different. President, after five years, you throw out, isn't it? A king is a king permanently. Upende? Spare. God is not a president. He is king. And that means what he says, you have to follow. There's no way you can actually avoid it or feel like it will change. And for these two boys, they were, it was very clear. They were offering strange fires. One of the commentaries I, I read said, when, when they started the altar, fire came from heaven and lit. Now, but after some time, they felt, and so from then onwards, fire was not supposed to go off. Every time you want to set fire, you took it and you put on wherever they, you wanted the fire. But now the boys decided they can also make their own fire. They were dead. How come we, we think we can, we, that, that, that we can actually play with them and uh, nothing will happen? We can play with God and nothing will happen. I keep asking myself, what could make a believer to veer off? Clear instructions. This is the way to worship me. This is the way to light the fire. This is the way to, 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 to start the fire and to be a priest. If I had the time, I would have wanted us to discuss. But I still think we one or two minutes. What do you think causes people to veer off the written instructions on how to serve God, how to obey him? how to live for him. We are not a big group, so we can talk even from the back over here. Because it's, remember, you are going to help us. Because tomorrow you'll be the one veering off. So to stop us from veering off, just tell us. Anybody? Remember, nobody is wrong. It's your view. And you are titled, yes? Social convention. What? Meaning, uh, social convention, meaning... Uh, Peer pressure. Yeah. Okay. After all, this is the way lecturers behave. And I'm also a lecturer. Yeah. So how can I behave different? Mm. Okay. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Another one? What causes a serious Christian to start fearing off clear instructions of the scriptures? Yeah. You become familiar with it. I thought if you are familiar, you know it better. So is that assumption that you have maybe before you go to church, you think you're familiar with the things of God, but then you do not accept it. So I can see the word familiar here means you start taking things for granted. Okay. So basically, it doesn't, but you know, after all. Is there a possibility also the fact that I have served the Lord for so long? It now gives me the freedom. To be a rough, a atadu. <laughs> you know the young people say, utadu. So I'm asking God, utadu, can you really do without me? You are telling God. Is that a possibility? It's a possibility. Yeah. Somebody else? Yes, at the far back. The scripture says you shall know the truth, and the truth, the truth will set you free. But sometimes knowledge of the guilt in us also makes us feel bad. Oh, Okay. The truth. Let me ask a second question. Maybe you answer both, the first and the second. What example do you know of where Christians have accepted non biblical issues and they are now normally practiced in church? What is it? Not inside your church, we, we don't want you to talk about the pastor may throw out, but <laughs> talk about churches, not your church. What is it that is happening that you can easily suggest it's a fearing of? And then answer the first one. Both questions. Before you answer mine, you want to ask? Oh, go ahead. I think this is a 
Okay. Whereby the compromise of kids. Okay. So that the kids are in the way. Okay. Yes. I call it the compassion. Okay. We are saying that the status quo. You want to rem to maintain the status quo. Don't don't uh, shake the uh, the cut. Okay. 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 That's something to consider. Anybody else in with an example of something happening in the church generally, and it's already accepted by the church, and it's likely to be veering off from true worship? Yes? agree with you, that accepting well-known village sinners who become elders in the church because of the amount of money they are giving. And I know that, I don't know, you know, you know this story, it happened in Kangema, 1970s, where they were doing, that's, that's the time, most in the, before, in the, before independence, most churches were mad houses. We used to worship in mad houses. But somewhere in the 70s, people started building stone houses. So, and it was seen as progress in a place where your church became a stone house. Now, so they did a lot of harambees. So there was this particular harambee in Kangema, where they called rich people to come, and the bishop was there. And the guy who was going to be the guest of honor to give most money, and was giving, he was going, he was giving a kid, I think, if I remember, he was doing something like 70,000. And that is 50-something 50 years ago, so it was a lot of money. When he finally was called in front, and the bishop and others are there, he said by saying, I brought you money, yes, to build a church. But let's agree together. You are going to stop talking against my bars. All this money I've got, you know I run bars. And I've got my money from bars. We let's agree together. If you accept this money, you no longer talk against bars. Of course, the bishop felt like going under the it was very embarrassing. And the guy stood there waiting. Oh, the chief of the area stood up and says, accept the money. It's against this it's for development. It's a development issue. Now, you can see, I always say, I wish more rich people were like that. Where they come out open. Because why do you want my money and you are talking against my business? Am I communicating? And you see, money giving part of Offering money is a, a way of worship. Would you agree with me? So the guy is worshipping with the money. The scriptures are clear. They were told prostitutes were not allowed to bring money to the temple. Have you read that in the Bible? You cannot. In other words, God is not interested in money from prostitution and corruption. But that's God. Most of our pastors don't mind it. That, I agree, is offering strange fires. Anybody else? Another example? The idea of glorifying the man of God, uh, giving him authority that is even above the authority of Christ, and the, the rich and wise. Those are trends that we are seeing in the churches. Yeah. Church. Initially, they started slowly. When I'm now talking, a lot of students invite me for something they call, they call the elders' dance, which is the liver's party. And I try to help them to, to about to, to discuss life after campus. I tell them, when you leave campus, do not go to any church. Only go to the church of Jesus Christ. Tell me, how shall we know? Very simple. If somebody has put his picture and his wife on the road, he has announced in advance, this is not Christ's church, it's my wife's and my church. And in most of those, most of those places, if you disagree with the pastor, you are thrown out. Am I right? And it, and it serves you okay. Why are you doing in somebody's church? You should have looked for Christ's church, where the pastor himself is only a participant. 
Because Christ does not offer the headship of the church to anybody. He says, I'm the head of the church. Have you read that? But when you see the husband and wife putting, and by the way, it works automatically. When they go, their children take, that's when you know it was a personal enterprise. Only you supported a personal enterprise. You asked them, the other day I was in, no, let me not say where I was, uh, in case I'm talking about your uncle. But, but they, 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 I was in a small church and they were te- telling me how, why they ended up starting a church. They were in, they were in a church and they, they, the offering was given. The people were counting, were ready to count. Then the wife of the pastor came and took all the money and put it in her kiondo. I was saying, Mama Kanisa, Ninini, says when he started the church, where were you? And she marched out. The following Sunday, thinking that the husband would correct, the husband said, there is a door of entering the church. There is also the same door is actually available for exit. In other words, what the wife did is supported by the husband. Are we together? That's the kind of church. So you need to understand, and they are there now everywhere. Personal enterprise. I come from a big church, and you're always struggling with money. But those people <laughs> always have money. Why? They don't use money for church purposes. They use it for personal service. The kind of car he drives, a person who runs a big church cannot afford that car. He's running a small church and driving a big one. Why? All money is his personal money. And in fact, they even encourage you. When you go and you give an offering to the church, that's not his money. What is, where is my money? So you must always divide the money between what you will give the church and what you give the man of God. If you want the man of God's blessing. And they have changed the scriptures to where blessings come from the man of God. You know, the other day I circulated to my mentees what is called the high priestly prayer. The one Aaron was taught in order to bless the people. And it's a prayer. Aaron knew he is not a source of a blessing. So he calls to God to bless the people. Just go back and check the ironic, ironic prayer. It is a prayer to God. Because clearly a priest is not source of blessing. He can be a vehicle, but not source. So he cannot be a source of... He can even tell you, I'll curse you. He has no ability to curse. Curse and blessings are in God's hands. And here God is saying, a car that is not deserved doesn't know how to land on that airport of a righteous man. Am I communicating? But then we have grown to where, where we are, uh, and my time is up, our timer, um, where we are, uh, we are taking things and taking the wrong way. The last one, which has become very big, is a mixture of traditions and Christianity. Some syncretic mixture. Such that you'll go, you'll go, to, this is a Christian, this is a Christian family, and uh, of course, my age, I've been involved in those sort of things. We even start with the prayer until you start negotiating for a girl. And I tell you, you know, where we come from, in Mount Kenya, this is what Agekoyo uh, Namobi said. And unless you do it, you'll get a curse. And so a lot of those traditional things are done in a total and biblical way. You go to Western Kenya, and they're having makubusho. Ever heard of makubusho? And pastors are there supervising the makubusho. Totally unbiblical. I can talk about openly because you remember the vice president, they, they went to London to get the shadow to Kitale. Did you read the newspaper? Wamalua. You remember Kijano Wamalua? And the pastors were there supervising a demonic activity. Now, I, I, I think some of you will think I'm against lawyers. I'm talking about Kikuyu is also doing the same. The Mijikenda also doing. They are fully in the church and fully in the in traditions all at the same time. The word of God is saying that those are strange fires and they will have certain consequences. Let me just read First Corinthians Verse, chapter 10, verse 20. No, but the sacrifice of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participant with the demons. When you participate in Makubusho, you are participating in demonic worship. 
When I first read it, I thought, eh, that's too strong. So I had to look, I looked for another version because that's the NIV. I looked for King James. It reads, rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. Let me ask you, are Kikuyus Jews or Gentiles? Kikuyus. Are they Jews or Gentiles? And what are we being told? All oh, Kikuyu religious worship is a worship of demons. Don't quote me, read for yourself. Or maybe I should look for another version. Because I actually went to about seven, eight versions, just in case there is something I'm misunderstanding. So, and remember, the Bible is not saying that we should uh, stop our culture. No, just go to the book of Acts, chapter 15, verse 20. It was, uh, Acts 15 is a debate as whether true worship means abandoning Gentile culture to copy the Jewish one. After a long debate, they said, no, even the Jewish culture never helped them. Let the Gentiles continue with their customs, except the following. So the Bible, the verse 20 says, but we write to them that they abstain. And now the list is given. In other words, saying, continue your customs, except the following. Number one, worship of idols. Number two, fornication or sexual immorality. Number three, strangled meat of strangled animals. Number four, anything that involves blood. So you can see clearly, we are not talking about, again, this culture. God allows you to continue with your culture. You know, when I, when I left the university, I was the chairman of the university, Christian 1975. You know, at the time we were not South Beach University, there was only one. So when we finished and we were looking for a house, we got a house with my secretary, the senior secretary, in Arab West. So we created our own culture. culture. Culture includes customs, but it also includes beliefs. And within no time, it found, I found out that my Ugali was better than others. So I became the Ugali specialist. As we were. So that's our culture. That's when it's Ugali day, Nganga will cook. That's our culture. But there's nothing wrong with it. Are we together? When you go to Kikuyus, they will get this food and that food and match it together. Other tribes wonder, surely, how can you get good food and bad food and put it together? What's wrong with Kikuyus? Nothing wrong with us. But we are not asking you to eat it. But my wife knows I enjoy it. So you don't stop, though we don't stop customs that are not religious. But when it comes to beliefs, that if you do this, you avoid shira. You never heard of shira? Avoid shira. If you do this, you avoid shira. That's why I must get involved in, you know, like I was living in Kisumu. And one night I had ko 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 with the, 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 the beat nyawawa, something called nyawawa. And it's supposed, when it reaches your house, you're supposed to beat it until it goes to the lake. So my wife was uh, then a teacher in Kisumu, Kisumu boys. So she was asked by the, the, in the staff room, did you beat? Said, what was I supposed to beat? Because if you don't beat it, they'll land in your house. Now, can you imagine Christians believing that kicking things will stop the demons entering their home? And they are in the church on Sunday. Those are strange fires. You cannot believe in traditional religion and Christianity are the same. He says, I'm a jealous God. It needs to be clear if you are blessed, who blessed you? Was it Rwanda Magere? Was it Jesus? And you need to come out clear that you don't follow the beliefs of your, tra of your traditions. You follow Christ. But customs, you can continue with them. Anyway, my time is up. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, these are easy things to speak, difficult to practice. Because in seeking to practice them, we are going to lose friends. We may even have to leave the churches we have been attending. Something is called upon us. It will also cause us to have trouble with our clansmen. Even with our own parents who may require us to do things we can never do now that we are born again. Lord, give us the courage to make a stand because we know we are better off with your blessings than the blessings of parents. Lord, guide us so that we become practitioners of your word. In Jesus' name we pray.